Well, brothers and sisters, we have been sort of doing a, a, a series on the letter of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the people of Ephesus, the Christ followers of Ephesus. And we are going to continue that on by looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 5, verse 2. And if you remember from last week, we are talking about the importance of keeping the bond of peace, of of working together and of loving one another and, and really of creating room and graciousness and humility for and towards each other. And so Paul is going to continue in that vein and unpack some more details about how we are called to, to do that. And we are going to hopefully unpack some practical ways in which we can do that in our context as we love one another. So let us first hear what the scriptures say and then uh, go from there hearing what God has to speak to us. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 25 to 5 verse 2. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need a little bit of context here. We need to remind ourselves of the situation in which the people of Ephesus and of the Roman world, uh, that the situation that they lived in. Because there are some ways in which it's pretty radically different for us. And, and those ways are largely, um, well, there's significant cultural differences, but there's also significant technological differences. Now, um, how many of you work more than, say, 25 kilometers away from here? Okay, so a few of you. How many more than 10 kilometers away from here? Okay, more of you. Yes. How many of you live more than 10 kilometers away from here? Yes. Good. All right. So now, does anybody know the average speed of walking? No, I don't know either. Four miles an hour? Three miles an hour? Three miles an hour? So how long would it take you to walk 10 kilometers then, my mathy dad? About three hours? Yeah? Okay. So... How many of you would walk three hours or more to get to church? <laughs> yes, yes, I've got, a, I've got at least one dedicated individual. Awesome. Yeah. No, okay, think about this, right? The reality of the Roman world is that the majority of people get everywhere they go by foot. Sometimes you have a donkey, very few people have a horse, but you walk a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. 
And so you are going to live and work, and if you get to go to school, you are going to do all of those things in a very limited area, geographical area. Which means, among other things, that you are probably going to be forced, whether you like it or not, to know the people that you live around and work around and hang around with a lot, really, really well. Right? Like I'm thinking like Verbergville get to know each other well. Right? Like um, you, you live and you work and you hang out and you do everything together. You don't have the luxury of going into Brockville to pick up some stuff except maybe once or twice a year. You don't have the luxury of just popping in there every day for work or, or going to Kingston or Ottawa or whatever. These are major, major, major journeys. Right? This is a big deal. Not only that, but you don't have the internet or television or radio or anything like that, right? Um, how many of you know who Billy Graham was? Okay. How many of you ever saw Billy Graham in person? Okay. A few of you, but a lot less than those of you who know who he is. Most of us got introduced to Billy Graham via the radio or TV, right? That's how we got that information. Nowadays, you have access to so many great preachers and some not so great preachers too, right? You, you've got Andy Stanley and you've got Timothy Keller and you've got all kinds of great preachers that you can have access to anytime you want through, through the internet, through television, through uh, podcasts, through all these things. But you didn't have that in Paul's day. The preacher you had, if you had a preacher at all, was the preacher you were stuck with. Much better for me. You had no one to compare me to. <laughs> so I come out looking really good no matter what. Oh, right? It's such a different world. You know the people you live with because your circle is geographically so small. And you don't know the world around that nearly so much and can't be influenced in the same way as you would be today by those things. Now, there are consequences for that reality. Some of them are great and some of them not so great. A fellow named Neil Postman wrote a great book called Technopoly, and in it, he discusses the reality that every technology is a double-edged sword. It has good things that it offers, and it also has potentially bad things that it offers. He even talks about how literacy, sort of universal literacy, and the pencil and paper offer good and bad things. For example, if you can write everything down, then you don't need to remember everything. So your capacity for memorizing and remembering facts is lowered. That's the bad thing. The good thing is that you can indeed write it down and you can communicate it with other people without speaking with them necessarily. You can share knowledge from generation to generation to generation. There are so many good things as well. Some of the consequences of the technology of being mobile like we are by either virtually or physically are that we have a tendency to not know our neighbors nearly as well as we would have 150, 200 or more years ago. And so when Paul talks to the people of Ephesus about speaking honestly, truthfully to their neighbor, this has both really great significance for us, but it's also slightly different significance. When you are living in a close-knit family like you do, uh, say, in Verbergville, to pick on you guys again, right? 
you probably should be careful about how you say certain things. You're probably going to have more opportunity to say certain things that may be difficult to hear too because you're with each other all the time and you see some of the struggles that your family is going through, right? But, but you also have to be careful because otherwise you can create family, not that you would with your family because you guys are awesome, but you could create fa family feuds that split the family apart, right? And, and I'm using verbergs, but really it's true for all of us, right? With our families, the people whom we know the most, we have more opportunity to speak truth. But we also have more opportunity to blow up the family through carelessness or anger or bitterness and so on. There's opportunity there. Greater intimacy and growth and love and a deeper, genuine relationship. Someone who can come up to me and say, Pastor Dan, can I talk to you about something that might be hard to hear? That's hard, but it's also deeper. At the same time, the person whom I love very much who comes up to me and says, you know what? I really despise the choices you've made and I think you're a terrible, terrible person and I want nothing to do with you. That is so much harder to survive than the complete stranger who says that to you. Right? Now, Paul is talking in a context where they more closely resemble that family relationship in their natural everyday life because of these geographic technological constraints. They live closer together geographically and emotionally and, and, and relationally. And so when Paul talks to them about putting off falsehood and speaking truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body, he is looking at the group of Christians, in this case, when he says we are, uh, speak truthfully to your neighbor, he's speaking probably mostly to Christians about each other, right? That's not to say that he doesn't think that the unbeliever is your neighbor, but rather that in this context, he is focusing on Christ followers with each other, right? So you are neighbors and members of one body. And he's speaking to people who have probably known each other for a significant portion of their lives and who regardless, because of their faith as a minority in a place where they are risking the fact of persecution at any moment, they are living in a more intimate relationship than probably any they have ever known as a community. And that intimate relationship that they have now as the church in Ephesus is probably more intimate than any relationships we have except in our immediate family. Because it's just different context. And so that potential for blowing up the family, the family of God, and that potential for going deeper are so much greater. That is why Paul emphasizes this so much. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Right? Don't, don't go to bed seething with rage because Satan loves to take anger. Not all anger is bad. Some anger is important and good and, and righteous even. But Satan loves to work through anger. Anger is a great one. He'd love to take that in and weave in some bitterness and some malice and some looking for revenge and some other stuff. So, you know, make it right, Paul says. Make it right. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And, and then he goes on, anyone who's, 
was, has been stealing must steal lo, no longer, but mu must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Now you may think, okay, what what is the church in Ephesus made up of former thieves? Is that what this is about? And undoubtedly there were probably some otherwise it seems a little bit odd that he would mention it but on the other hand he is speaking not just about those who are literal thieves but about those of us who steal unintentionally or intentionally from each other think about Ananias and Sapphira right with their deceptive lies selling all they had and giving it to the church when really they were holding some back for themselves. Right? I mean, it was theirs, but they were stealing. Right? Or, or what about you and me? Do I give all that I am called to give to you as a church community? Do you give all that you are called to give, not only to the church community, but to the community around us? And I'm not talking just financially, although that is part of it, but I'm talking of talents and time and giftings and honesty and humility and so on. Am I stealing from you in the way I live my life? Are you stealing from me, from one another, from the community in the way that you live your life and if so how do we stop can we stop and give instead doing good things so that we can give to those who are in need whether they are in need financially or whether they are in need of a, an encouraging word or they're in need of somebody to rake their lawn or they're in need whatever Then Paul goes back to speaking. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. This one's tricky too. This goes hand in hand with this idea of putting off falsehood and speaking truthfully and of speaking the truth in love that we talked about last week right unwholesome talk is not just talk that is mean or nasty or or whatever or or rather you can't classify unwholesome talk simply that way it's also the the delicate reality of trying to speak the truth in love but not not hiding the truth See, this is a mistake that Christ followers have made an awful lot. The idea that we need to hide certain truths from one another. As a, as a former Christian school educator, uh, you know, I saw this in why parents would send their kids to Christian schools. They would sometimes say that they wanted to send their, Christian, their kids to Christian schools, partly at least in order to protect them. To protect them from the realities of the world around them. To hide from them some of the truths that they would face in the world. I want to protect them from drug use. I want to protect them from foul language. I want to protect them from alcohol. I want to protect them from the dangers of, of science as proclaimed in the public school classroom. I want to protect them from the dangers of learning about uh, same-sex attraction. I want to protect them from all these things. But that's not at all what God tells us to do. God does not in any way call us to protect our children from those things. Instead, God calls us to prepare them. To prepare them 
so that they can give an answer for the hope that they have. And this is part of the tough reality. Is that we need to learn to do that as community too. Even though we don't live and work with one another each and every day. And we don't see each other each and every day. We don't have the same kind of intimate community that they did in Ephesus. But nonetheless, somehow we need to learn to be able to speak truth to one another. And not avoid the truth. You've heard the saying... If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. But that's not strictly speaking biblical. If you can't say it in love, then probably you shouldn't say it. But you can say everything in love if you practice and learn. So here are some practical ways, hopefully, to speak truth in love. Okay? So the, some of this comes from pre-marriage uh, classes that I teach, right? Because if anybody needs to be able to speak the truth in love, it's married couples. They've got to be able to do it or they're in deep doo-doo. Uh, excuse the language, <laughs> right? Um, but it, some of it also comes from uh, a book called Crucial Conversations, uh, which is which is a great book. It's not particularly Christian. It's written by a, at least one of the authors is a Christian person, but it, it's uh, not particularly Christian per se. Um, it's more targeted at businesses and so on, but it's got some great, great stuff in it. One of the things to remember in trying to speak the truth in love is your approach, right? Uh, chances are good that it's, that it's not a great idea to say, you know what, Cole, you smell really bad out in the open in the middle, in the middle of a worship service. Probably not a good idea, right? Yeah, you stink, buddy. No, that's not true. I don't know whether you stink or not, but um, right if it's, a, if it's going to be a sensitive thing, you need to say, hey, Cole, can I talk to you about something that might be hard to hear? Right? Prepare the way. Can I talk to you about something that might be hard to hear? Right? They're, they're both going to be a little bit nervous because this is an unusual introduction to a topic, but they're also going to be instantaneously, okay, Okay, I'm a little bit prepared. It's not coming totally out of the blue. There's some warning here. There's also timing to be aware of, right? If Gwyneth and I are in the middle of talking to Lydia about something serious and important, and I take that time to look at Gwyneth and say, you know what, you are so wrong on this <laughs> in the middle of our conversation, probably a bad parenting technique. It's also going to get me in a lot of trouble, right? Later, when we're not together with Lydia talking about this in the heat of the moment, then I say, hey, can we, can we talk about that last conversation? It, it might be hard for us to go through it, but we really need to hash some stuff out, right? Timing is important too, right? Being careful with your language is also very important, not only in introducing the topic, but also introducing, excuse me, the topic, but also in, in how you speak, right? There, this is maybe going to be tough for some of us because we don't always talk about our feelings all that much. We tend to speak in terms of absolutes or tend to exaggerate things very grandly. But if, if, if I say, you make me feel so angry when you leave the toothpaste tube open and whatever, right? Instead... When I do that, I am putting the blame on you for my feelings. I'm saying, you make me angry. Right? Instead, I can say, 
I feel pretty frustrated when I find the toothpaste tube uncapped, uncovered, right? Um, that's not your fault. You didn't, you didn't force me to be angry. I feel that way. Can we talk about it and come to some kind of resolution? Maybe we have two different toothpaste tubes <laughs> so she can leave the cap off hers all she wants. What? Now we're going to have a conversation about this later. She never leaves the cap off the toothpaste, just so you know. <laughs> right? Okay? I feel is, is good. To say, I feel this way. To say, you make me, or you did this to me, not always so great. Right? When we're talking about theological issues, humility is huge. The church, as we talked about last week, the church is full of people who decided that they had a corner on the truth. The truth, capital letters. Either the truth in the big picture or this particular truth. And because they had a, a corner on this particular truth, they decided that they could not stand being with each other for that particular reason. Right? My father, when they came to Perth and started living near there, there wasn't a Christian Reformed Church right in Perth, of course, and so they decided to go to the Free Methodist Church. And Dad said it was because it has the word free in it. <laughs> it's free! Ha, that's awesome! I don't have to pay any money. Of course, that was not true. But the Free Methodists, um, they have slightly different theology than us in terms of predestination versus free will. And part of the reason that we are not one church, not specifically the Free Methodists, but that whole group, the Wesleyans, Free Methodists, and so on, part of the reason that we and the, the Reformed Church and the Presbyterian Church and so on are not one with the Free Methodists is that we argued so much about free will versus predestination that we said, no, no, we can't be together. And sadly, there was even a lot of killing. Right? When we speak about theological matters, we need to have humility. Truthfully, when we speak about anything, we need to have humility. This is what I believe. These are my experiences that lead me to this. This is what I have learned. What have you learned? Where are you coming from? Where is your heart? Why is it so important to you? Why is it so important to me? We need to have that humility. This is how we get from unwholesome talk to only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, Paul goes on, of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, that the day, the day when we will be raised up with our new and glorified bodies, just as Jesus, who is the firstborn from the dead, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I don't think we've had any brawling here at Athens Christian Reformed Church for a long time. Anybody participate in any brawls lately? No. But we do sometimes get angry with each other. Thankfully, not too much rage that I'm aware of. But bitterness can creep in. Slander 
can creep in. Malice can poke its ugly head up. But I've got to tell you that one of the joys of my life here at Athens Christian Reformed Church has been being on council. And, and this is not a plug for people to join council, although it is really good. Right, Cole? Yeah, yeah, you have to answer that, right? <laughs> you have to speak the truth in love, Cole. Right? Um, it, it is, honestly, being on council is, is a lot of work. We won't pretend anything different, but it is really good. And part of the reason that it's really good for me here is that I get into council and there are people who disagree with one another and we are on council together. And sometimes we have significant and sometimes heated debates about important things. And at the end of it, we talk with one another and say, hey, look, I hope I didn't, you know, step on your toes too much there. Um, you know, I, I love you. We're friends. We're brothers. It's all good. And there is a camaraderie there that lasts beyond whatever debate there may be. And the council here has learned to, to so much to speak the truth in love to one another. They listen to each other and they genuinely process through and pray and, and they share what they feel about things, their fears. Oh, that is so good. If you've got a group of men who can share what they're afraid of in our culture, oh, that's good. That's awesome. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's what we're called to as a whole body to. Not that counsel is perfect. Certainly I'm not. And I know that our council members are not either. But we can debate with one another without descending into bitterness or rage. There certainly hasn't been any brawling. And they're careful to avoid slander and malice. Instead, brothers and sisters, we can be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave us. Why? Why do we want to do these things? Why, do, why is it so important to do these things? <laughs> Paul, chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Why? It's not said in here, but it's true nonetheless. Believe it or not, it is a big relief to be free from malice and bitterness and anger and resentment and slander and, and all those things. Oh, it is so freeing not to be subsumed with all those yucky things. Number two, we are dearly loved children of God, right? Dearly loved children of God. We're not just creator and creation. We're certainly no longer uh, king versus enemy rebels. We are now dearly loved children. And third, because we are dearly loved children, we can live as Christ did. Giving ourselves up. See, because that too is a relief. Not focusing on me anymore. Instead, giving myself to you. To God. To Athens. That is a relief. 
I don't have to be self-centered anymore. I can be selfless, just like Jesus, my Savior. So, brothers and sisters, let us walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that the way of love, the way of living in love is opened up to us through Jesus Christ and through the power of your spirit working in us. We know, O oh God, that without you, we could never be like the people that, that Paul describes here in Ephesians chapter 4 and the beginning of 5. That apart from you, this is not possible. But God, with you, all things indeed are possible. And we can be free. We can be free to speak truth in love. We can be free to build one another up. We can be free from anger and brawling and slander and malice. We can be free from stealing and instead be giving. We can be compassionate and forgiving just as you forgave us. And we can do this all together as one body in Christ our Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.